Okay. Now, okay, now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, press, but I think it's not enough. Yeah. So, well, Again, sorry, thank you for your patience. <laughs> thank you, welcome here. For the third time. <laughs> the third time. Uh, well, in psychoanalysis, you know, we always have these things, the repetition, so <laughs> it's very an analytical. So welcome everyone. Uh, this is an, a special activity of Initiative Toronto. We are linked to, of the NLS. And uh, we are welcoming Patricio, Thank you for accepting our invitation. He's a member of the EOL, our Argentinian school. He's a member of the WAP, the World Association of Psychoanalysis. Also, he's a member, uh, um, analyst member of the school, AMP. That, that is a very important nomination to those. It's a recognition of, of the analysts that are, um, are recognized for their teaching, for their work, and the, also the training or formation of other analysts. So thank you, Patricio. The floor is yours. Okay, I'm gonna um, um, I'm gonna share the, the text for you can read it uh, while I'm talking because my pronunciation is not very very well sometimes. Uh, yes. Now, one second. Well, do you see it? It's okay. Well, um, I I want to 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 work with you. Um, the seven definitions on anxiety uh, in the seminar 10. Um, and we are going to try to follow the, the winding path that Lacan presents us, mainly in the first seven chapters of the seminar in order to define anxiety, like in, in the layers of phenomenon. The first definition. Lagan starts his first chapter called Anxiety in the Net of Signifiers, situating the question of anxiety for the analyst starting out in this practice. He initially wonders if the anxiety felt by the analyst is the same as that felt by the novice analyst. That is, if the analyst is in the same point of the an as the analyst in relation to anxiety. The novice analyst has not yet learned to tame his own anxiety in the encounter with the patient, and that's why he's close to the analyst's anxiety. Unlike him, the experienced analyst, analyst has learned to tame his own anxiety. He's, he can listen to many things and be, and be a very good analyst because of his experience and because of his training, but since he has tamed his own anxiety, he does not have the sensitivity to listen to a specific point. The point where the anxiety of the analyst and the other and the one of novice analyst are articulated, which is with respect to the enigma of the other's desire. Lacan thus locates in the novice analyst where he has his first encounters with the first patients and ask himself, for example, what can I tell him? What does this patient want from me? He is situating the enigma of the other's desire. So the point of articulation between the anxiety of the novice analyst and that of the analyst is that both are moved by the presence of the other's desire. With this introduction, Lacan situates an element that he had already worked at the end of, the, of his seminar nine. And for this, this reason, he makes a quick reference at that and does not spend much time defining it, but it is a complex reference. The dimension of the, of the first definition of the anxiety, which is the anxiety in the presence of the other's desire, the anxiety in front of an enigmatic desire, a desire that we can't account for, 
and the, signific and the signifiers that we have at our disposal, either the, the signifiers that the other enunciates when formulating his demand, or rather, or rather the signifiers of our history, all that network of signifiers are not enough to account for the enigmatic point of the other desire. So beyond the demand, beyond what can be put into words, there is a point beyond which con constitutes Lacan's first definition of anxiety, anxiety in front of the other's desire. He illustrates his definition with the analogy of the encounter with the praying mantis, taking the figure of the female insect, which once he copulates with the male, it's his head. In that encounter with the praying mantis, the desire of the other does not give me back a place as a, as a subject in the symbolic sense, nor an imaginary recognition of myself. I am an object for his satisfaction, an object for his juizance. Therefore, in front of that praying mantis, what is presented is the opacity of his desire, the enigma of his desire. This representation is situated in his graph of desire in the place of uh, S A, which is the, the name, A Barrett, with Lacan, which Lacan designates with the phrase que voy, of the devil in love by Casot, a story in which that enigmatic figure of the other's desire is revealed. As we said, the first definition of anxiety, along with the analogy of the praying mantis, were worked at the end of seminar nine. And we will see that throughout seminar 10, we will find two axes of anxiety with two different directionalities. One refers to the dimension of the other, and the other refers to dimension of the object. It's a, a path of all the seminary, the two uh, ways of the anxiety. Lagan begins his definition of anxiety and his work on anxiety in relation to desire, to the desire of the other and the enigmatic desire of the other. But then proceed progressively formulates that the dimension of anxiety in relation to object A. They are the two sides of the same coin. One is the anxiety in its relation to the desire, to the desire of the other. And the other one is the anxiety in relation to the object. But we will see that one side, the anxiety in relation of the desire of the other, is more linked to the dimension of the desire. And the other side of the coin, anxiety in relation to the object, is more linked to the dimension of juizance. Therefore, the anxiety will figure as a point of articulation and at the same time of differentiation between desire and juizance. The anxiety linked to the other in the symbolic and in the field of desire, and the, anxiety linked, and the anxiety linked to the object, and therefore to the drive in the real, and in the field of juizance. So Lacan will work this, these two dimensions throughout this seminar, the one linked to desire and the other linked to, to the juizance. The second definition. This second definition is in the first uh, way, the way of the desire. Lagan then relocates the network, the net, uh, uh, until here you, uh, it's okay? Okay. Lagan then relocates the network of signifiers taken in the sense that anxiety has been interrogated by philosophy. Anxiety has been explored by, for the first time in the history of philosophy by existentialism. And Lacan pays homage to existentialists to the extent that they have explored anxiety as a fundamental effect that brings into play the relationship to existence and the relationship to design. 
since Heidegger, other authors, such as Sartre in one way and Kierkegaard in another, have worked the issues of anxiety. Each of them situates a trait of anxiety which relates to it, but at the same time, Lacan will show that, it's, that it is not exactly anxiety. The term each has used in his exploration of anxiety is for Heidegger, the search or care of the assign, the, the preoccupation of the being in its relation to its being and to death. For Sartre, the term he uses is seriousness. For Marx's existentialist, the term is commitment. Together with those terms, Lacan adds Freud with a term in relation to anxiety, which is the anxious expectation, the erwartung or anxious expectation. If the expectation, it is the anxiety in its state of, exp of expectation for what could appear show up. Lacan proposes that the work of the existentialist is the same work that Freud enunciates with the term anxious expectation. Kierkegaard uses another term, which is the concept of anxiety. The concept of anxiety sums up well for Lacan the network of signifiers that surround anxiety. It's the thought of anxiety. Is the concept of anxiety, but it's not anxiety as affect, as affect. Thinking about anxiety, committing to it, worrying about it, being serious about it, all the terms of the philosophers implies putting a distance regarding anxiety, putting it at a distance, but without being truly concerned about anxiety. It is not the same as being anxious. So the existentialists have thought about anxiety, but they have not located the effect of anxiety, which is what Lacan will do from perspective of the psychoanalysis. Thus, Kierkegaard's concept of anxiety and Freud's concept of Erbartung reflect that dimension of having anxiety as a distance, which is precisely what Lacan demonstrates with the concept of anxiety for existentialism. Once this is cleared up, the concept of anxiety in the network of signifiers, Lacan begins to locate what he defines as anxiety. In the first chapter was anxiety and the, of, on the enigma of the desires of the other. In chapter two, he defines anxiety as a sign of desire. In this way, he started the distinction with the concept of existentialities, angst, which included that we see in concert seriousness, commitment, which implies the dimension of anxiety as a sign. The sign differs from the signifier in that the signifier represents some, something for another signifier. And like this, the sign has the function of designating something, not for another signifier, but only to designate something. So the definition of anxiety as a sign of desire implies that it is designating desire, but that desire is not the desire of the subject, but as, he, as the first definition stated, the desire of the other. Thus, anxiety as a sign of a desire designates the enigmatic desire of the other. It is the sign of kewoi, which implies that when the dimension of anxiety appears, the subject is confronted with the enigmatic desire of the other. <clears throat> Lacan says, to teach what the effect of anxiety is, we could use the method of the catalog that consists of making a list of all possible affects, anxiety, anger, sadness, mourning, happiness, etc. But unlike the, the catalog of affects, anxiety differs because, as Lacan says, it is the fundamental affect. This definition is taken from Freud. Anxiety is the fundamental affect. It is not an affect like the others. 
the minimum form of, um, of form of anxiety is going to be linked to the initial element of the presence of the other's desire, the first mark left by the by the other's desire. With this uh, first signifier, working on the seminary, working on on the seminar nine, which is the unary thread. So anxiety as a sign of the other desires brings into play that anxiety is determined from the beginning, from the first marks of the other, by the other's desire. It becomes clear then why anxiety was defined by Freud as the fundamental affect, because it accounts for the presence of the desire of the other that determines, that causes, that produces the appearance of the subject, the constitution of the subject. In other words, the subject could not exist without the dimension of the other's desire. We have then the first two definitions of anxiety. The first definition, anxiety in front of the other's desire. And the second definition, anxiety as the sign of the other's desire. They seem to be almost equivalent definitions, but they are not because they bring into play two different dimensions of the other's desire. The first brings into play the enigmatic desire of the other, the kewoi, while the second brings, brings into play the initial marks, the marks that constituted the subject in relation to the other's desire. Uh, the, the, the difference you... you uh, it's, it's clear the difference between the two of them. The second definition brings into play the dimension that descends that other, which indicates that there is a desire of the other that is six since the emergence of the subject. And it is why anxiety is the fundamental effect. That is the difference uh, between the two definitions. In this second definition, what anxiety designates as a sign of desire is the presence of the other as such, whose marks are since the emergence of the subject. Therefore, the two definitions seem equivalent, but they are not. These two definitions, as we said before, are learning towards the other from, from a symbolic perspective, and therefore towards the desire. The following definitions will be directed towards Jewishans, that is, towards the real. This does not imply that they contradict each other or that, no, or, or that one definition annuls the previous ones, but rather that, that, but rather that they must be understood as overlapping layers. The first layer, the anxiety before the enigmatic desire of the other, the second layer, anxiety as a sign of the other's desire. And the other layers bring into play the dimension of the fantasy and the object A. So the third definition. In the third chapter, Lacan begins to refer to the fundamental fantasy. To do this, he will differentiate three dimensions, the world, the scene, and the scene of the scene. He takes the world from Levi-Strauss the as the pre-discursive reality, as the world in the most intuitive sense of what we could say, the world before the presence of the human. But that world as pre-discursive reality cannot be considered as a reality, but from the scene. The scene means three things. The scene in the symbolic sense, the signifying change. That is how we read the word from signifiers. The signifiers determine a construction of the world. It is not the world as such, but it's the world as read from the signifiers. Also, the scene means what Freud called the other scene of the, incan of the unconscious, their under showplats. That is, the unconscious was those signifiers we used to read the world and the reality, but without knowing that the unconscious determines our reading of reality. We believe that we can understand and choose the world we want to see, 
but as a matter of fact, we are determined by our signifiers and by our, our unconscious. Lastly, the sin is the sin of the fantasy. The fantasy is the phrase that functions as the point of origin of all signifiers. It determines how the word is read and how signifiers are combined in the, in the unconscious. So that the sin in, is one is on the one hand the unconscious, and the other hand the nucleus of that unconscious, the command of that unconscious that is the fantasy, the phantasmatic sentence. So we not only read the word from our signifier, signifiers, but we read it from the core of those signifiers, which is, for example, a child is being beaten. From a child is being beaten, we read a reality take by, taken by the signifiers of the damage, the beating, the pain, the sacrifice, etc. The third term is the sin of the sin. There, Lacan locates the dimension of reality, of consciousness, and therefore the dimension of the self. It is the theatrical scene in which we live our world, a scene with with characters, with a script, with drama. It is a scene on the theatrical scene in which we live our reality, or which we are convinced unless we go to an to go an analyst, and we can perceive that 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 this reality is a significant and phantasmatic construction. At that point, or our scene of the scene begins to disarm, to bring into play the other scene, the scene of the unconscious. This, these three dimensions are not corresponding by the, to the three eras I registers, but they are leaning towards them. The world is not exactly real, but it is a little closer to the real. The scene is both the unconscious and the fantasy, which is, which is close to the symbolic. And the scene of the scene can be located as imaginary. After defining this difference, Lacan begins with the construction of the optical schemas with which he situates the path, the path of the next three, three chapters in relation to the question to the question of Freudian anxiety and Lacanian anxiety, which is the subject of the fourth chapter. In the optical scheme, what is central is to locate how on the left side of AI, that is to say of the ego, but in its dimension of the real body, as Freud located an introduction to narcissism, the body itself is detected. And on the right side, the E uh, prima A, which is the investment of reality, the libidinal investment that the subject makes of his reality. That is, he defines two places. In the one on the left, which we indicate as the investment of the body itself, that is represented by the base, Lacan designates in the mouth of that day of that base the object A that can that that cannot be represented or symbolized which are the drives that is the real and in the other side in the investment of reality which is the vase on the right lacan locates in the mouth of that vase the minus phi which is the lack that is what what makes desire move in this way on the left side we have duisance and on the right side, we have desire. In the middle is the flat mirror, which Lagan says must be seen as a lozenge, as a window frame, as what frames our reality. This flat mirror is the other, as we design, as we designated as the scene, the symbolic signifiers on which we cut our reality. That is, we don't know see the world as it is, but rather we see a world cut out by signifiers. This does not imply thinking about in the manner of the matrix that we live in a world of lies, but it does imply thinking that the world is cut out by, is, well, is cut out by signifiers 
that raised the world from the sin. That sin that raised the world, that raised the world, is, the, is that other that frames reality. As we said, on the right side of the picture, we have reality. In this E prima A that designates the libidinal investment, what Freud situates as the libidinization of reality, the libido that li invests the people and the things of the external world. Uh, it's clear the, the difference in the, in one side is the, 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 the real body and the other side is of the frame is the reality. And in this reality is the lack in the reality that is uh, uh, the minus V. So the libidinal investment contacts the reality that we perceive. That is to say that we can not only name it, but also contact what objects of that reality interest us more than others. Each of these objects will have a determination and an importance and a, and a designation given by the significant division. And in turn, within our libidinized reality, there is going to be an element that cannot be named with the signifiers of the other or that can be invested libidinally. An element that is neither investor nor neighbor, which is the minus fee. And for Lacan, minus phi designates the lack. The lack, in turn, is articulated with, with this element that is object A, that is behind that lack, behind that minus phi that designates a lack, there is the drive element that is the object A. With this division, Lacan is going to situate two dimensions of anxiety. The dimension of anxiety, the minus phi, the minus phi, which is concentration anxiety, and the dimension of anxiety of the object A, which is Lacanian anxiety. So Lacan makes a difference between Freud, uh, Freud's anxiety, the castration anxiety, and Lacan's anxiety, the anxiety of the object A. So it Lacan is going to situate two forms of anxiety. To understand it, let's take a step backward. The minus phi is the function of the lack, and therefore the function of desire. In relation to desire, there is an oscillation that is inherent to desire, which takes two forms, lack, lack as desire and lack as castration, castration anxiety. In this way, what Lacan places in relation to castration, to castration anxiety is that the castration anxiety is the reverse of desire. When there is desire, there is castration anxiety. When there is desire, we lack something. And because we lack something, we move. If there was no lack, we would, we would not move or do anything because we would not lack anything and everything would be fine. As in the novel, The Red Grass by Boris Vian, a dog had, had a wish that was to have a little bird. And once they give him the little bird, as soon as he had the object he always wanted, the dog stopped doing all the things he did because he had finally got that object he always wanted. He was totally happy and enraptured by, this, by the, that object. Having achieved his absolute satisfaction, so he stopped talking, barking, moving, and he finally died. He lacked nothing. There was nothing to move his desire, and finally he ended, he ended up dying. Castration anxiety then is the reverse of desire, of desire in the sense that when the, the, there is desire, we are lacking in relation to something we are looking for. And we are looking for it's oriented by the signifier that is the signifier of the phallus. 
that is the signifier of this desire. It is a signifier that cannot be named. One cannot say what I desire is such a thing. When we are in the dimension of the symbolic phallus, it is a signifier that cannot be named, but that causes our desire, moves us, moves us in relation to the search for something, which always has some signification and that we always give by it by some name. But then, but that name is always wrong with respect to what we are really looking for. We name it, but it is always unsuccess unsuccessful. We look for it, and, it's, and it is always that is what is ahead like carrot. The carrot that it is in front, unnam unnameable, is the one that Lacan places at the minus fee. The minus fee as the signifier of the desire that guides our search. When there is a search, there is functioning of desire, and because of that lack, we do we do things. Otherwise, we would do not anything. But what is behind that carrot, that carrot is the cause of the desire that is the unrepresentable object, object A. That then is the Freudian castration anxiety. And Lacan opposes this anxiety, the Lacanian anxiety. That anxiety arises when the lack is blocked, when it cannot be desired, when there is no castration anxiety, that is when there is no lack. For this reason, Lacan designates Lacanian anxiety at the, as the lack of the lack. The lack of the lack means that the lack is abstracted, that is, that point of desire that designates the element of the search and the, desired, the desiring element oriented by the phallic signifier is abstracted. When it is abstracted, when the lack of lacking, another dimension of anxiety appears, which is the present of the object. So the fourth definition. When the lack is missing, there is no absence, there is no minus fee, and that implies that there is a presence. That presence is the presence of the object A. In other words, when the lack is missing, it appears in that place where there should be desire, where there should be minus fee, the presence of the drive. And that is Lacanian anxiety, the present of the object A. The presence in question is the present of the object. That means that the lack is missing because if there was a lack, there would be no presence. The present would be veiled. Lack and absence are the same. They are related to castration anxiety, while presence is the real presence of an object. Of, of an object. Is it clear? The, the difference between the Freudian anxiety and the Lacanian anxiety. One is the lack, the other is the lack of the lack and the presence of the object. Thus, the fourth definition of anxiety is anxiety is a, as a sign of the presence of the object. The second definition was the sign of the desire of the other. And the fourth definition is a sign of the presence of the object. You see the difference between them. One is towards the other, the other is towards the object. In this way, the third and fourth definition of some anxiety are linked. Anxiety as a lack of the lack and anxiety as a sign of the presence to the object, of the object. In this regard, Lacan says about Freud, Freud often speaks of sign anxiety, but a sign of what? Freud states that it is the sign of the proximity of, of satisfaction, of the proximity of the drive. That is the sign anxiety. Lacan then, translate, then translates the sign anxiety into a sign of, of the presence of the object A. At this level, the Amheinlich is presentified. 
this is the Freudian definition of the sinister. That which was familiar, which presented itself as the phantasmatic scene in which the subject recognized himself becomes unfamiliar, becomes not only enigmatic, but sinister. From this scene, but from this sign anxiety, Lacan begins to address the phenomenology of anxiety, which we will see at the end of this presentation. Up to this point, he, ha he has been conceptual conceptualizing the definition of anxiety, but from here on, in addition to conceptualizing it, he also begins to examine its phenomenology. That is the phenomena of anxiety, such as panic, horror, the sinister, the sign anxiety, etc. In the in the end, we will see all the all the the difference between them. Fifth definition: In chapters one, two, and three, Lacan clears the way to distinguish what is not anxiety. Thus, he states that anxiety is not a, not inhibition, anxiety is not the symptom, nor the definition of anxiety given by the philosophers that, that we have seen. And then he goes on with, with this approach in chapter five, where he talks, he talks about that which deceives. Uh, the chapter is called Which uh, Deceives. What deceives has four dimensions. The first dimension is the ego and the imaginary, the unknowing function of the ego, what, that we, what we used to call the sin of the sin, reality, consciousness. The, the second dimension is the demand of the other, which deceives the subject regarding his desire. This is the, the dimension that is, most, that is most at play in neurosis, which, is, which deceives with respect to desire. Lacan focuses on neurosis, stating that the neurotic asks to be demanded. The subject, in his relation to the other, enters the defiles of the demand. And even from the beginning, in the love relationship, the subject sus submits to the demand of the other. Behind the demand of the other, that which the other asks for, is his enigmatic desire, which, as we said before, is the kewoi. So, in order not to be confronted with it, the neurotic avoids it by submitting to the demand. And that is why Lacan says, than he asked to be demanded. The demand of the other presents itself in all the dimensions of the reality of the subject, in the scene in which the subject is working, studying, linking. In all these scenes, the relation between the subject and the demand of the other. In each of them, at work, the subject seeks to make himself demanded by the boss. In love, is seek to demand it by the partner, in study by exam dates and professors. The subject seeks to make himself demand in order, in order to be loved, and at the same time to avoid the anxious encounter with the question of Kewoi. In this way, the second dimension implies making oneself lovable for the other in the form of, of his demand. A third dimension of what deceives, he adds to this point. He says that the, that the neurotic consecrates his castration to the lack of the other. This implies that not only does he try to make himself amenable, lovable to the demand of the other, but that he puts himself as a fault consecrates his castration in order to sustain the other. Thus, he assures himself of the existence of the other, giving him his work, his study, his gestures of love in order to sustain the other as existent. Thus, 
the subject not only submits to the demand of the other, but also surrender his luck, puts himself in the other's hands in order to sustain the existence of the other. But when he surrendered his lack, consecrating his castration in order to sustain the, the existence of the other, in this way, he does not surrender his anxiety. This implies that we, that without knowing it, it is a strategy of the neurotic not to confront with the enigmatic desire. So he consecrates his uh, anxiety, his castration anxiety, but not his Lacanian anxiety. Uh, I don't know if you see the difference. Finally, he does not know what the other desires and therefore does not want to encounter it, nor does he was to encounter the other dimension of anxiety, which is the sign of the present of the object beyond the demand of the other. The fourth dimension of deception is of of deception is, as we said before, the network of signifiers. The, signifi the signifiers that are displaced in metaphor and metonymy also decide which respect to the real. The signifier is displaced in the chain and in, the, and in an analysis, it can orient us in relation to desire. And that is why we work with the signifier but the signifier is always displaced. And to that extent, the signifier never unequivocally designated something. Because it, because if it were to designate it, it would not be a signifier, but a sign. The signifier always refer, refers to another signifier. And for that, there is the rule of free association, interpretation, S1 and S2. But the signifier chain is on a very different level of the function of ignoration, of, of neither ignorance, ignorance of the ego, and of the function of the demand of the other in neurosis, on a very different level because it is not a pure deception deception like the first two because it is already orienting with respect to desire but it orients with respect to desire as long as it displaces it also has a function of deception thus having clearing having cleared all this path Lacan will place the fifth definition of, of anxiety anxiety is which does not deceive the fifth definition is articulated with the four, anxiety as a sign of the presence of the object, because it implies that was dot does not dot, uh, that was does not deceive is what designates the real. It is a complementary definition to the previous one, because anxiety as that which does not deceive allows us to understand what the previous definition means because anxiety as anxiety as a sign of the presence of the object implies that the, a, that anxiety is a sign of the real lacan redefines this as a sign the sign has a function has a function of designation of pointing and differs from the signifier which can be displaced and combined well, anxiety has, has a sign function. Thus, anxiety does not deceive because it has the function of designating the presence of the object as a sign of the real. So the first feature of the definition of anxiety as that which does not deceive is its function as a sign. The second feature of this of this definition is articulated with what we said in the second definition, in which we said that anxiety is a fundamental object. Is the fundamental affect because it is the only one that does not deceive. Lacan stated 
that love can deceive in its dimension of illusion, anger can be an acting, etc. That is to say that affects can deceive, but anxiety is the affect that does not deceive. That is why is the fundamental affect. The fundamental affect with the function of designator implies that when the subject is anxious, has no doubt of being, of being anxious. The other affects are equivocal and there can be doubt ab about them, but at the moment of anxiety, there is no doubt about our anxiety. So the sixth definition, the fact that there is no doubt ab about anxiety and that, and that anxiety does not deceive, leads to the sixth definition of, of anxiety, anxiety as certainty because is the fundamental affect and does not deceive anxiety. Anxiety has the characteristic of being a certainty. This leads to an important point of differentiation with psychosis. In the elementary phenomena of psychosis, whether from the minimal phenomena that the Clarenbaugh call small automatis, to the maximum elementary phenomena called great automatis, in other words, hallucinations and delusions, all of them are connoted by certainty. The elementary, the elementary phenomenon implies certainty. And unlike the certainty of psychosis, in neurosis, there is never center certainty. There is always doubt, deception, conflict, and even all the formations of the unconscious are, character, are characterized by being disquisite. The signifier is displaced metaphorically or metonymically. Therefore, there is never certainty of the, in the signifier nor in the unconscious. Therefore, in neurosis, the fact that, that anxiety is the only affect that has certainty is important because it orients it orients the direction of the cure if anxiety is the affect that does not deceive the affect that designates the real that implies that anguish is the only affect with certainty is the only point of certainty in neurosis this differentiation this it differentiates it from psychosis. In psychosis, there is always certainty. In neurosis, there is only certainty in, in anxiety. This implies that it orients the analyst, the analyst to locate where the real is in that subject. Anxiety marks the way because it designates which, with its certainty the only things that does does not deceive as we said before the signifier deceives the affect deceive the imaginary deceives but anxiety does not because it has certainty in addition to orienting the direction of the cure this certainty allows lacan to define what he calls the act both the act of the subject and the analyst and the analytic act. The act could be understood in its broad definition as including all forms of tacting, but Lacan differentiates them from the act. That is to say that the act is not the behavior, the daily acting, the doing, but the transforming act. This act defines a before and an after. An act that, tra that transformed the subject, who is not the same before and, ap and after the act. The act is related to the certainty of anxiety. Lagan defines it in this way. To act is to strip certainty from anxiety. To strip certainty from anxiety means that anxiety designates the only affection of certainty and from that affection of certainty, we act. In other, in other words, true acts are never without anxiety. If there is no anxiety, 
and it is done lightly, it is not an act. It can be act, it, it can be an acting out, a passage to the act, a symptom, anything but not an act. It is subject, if the subject does not go, go through the anxiety as a certainty and does not strip the act from certainty, then we are not in the sphere of the act. When there is an act as a condition, there is anxiety. And not just any anxiety, a deep anxiety designated by certainty, by certainty. The seventh and last definition. Finally, Lacan situates the relation that anxiety has with object A and with the real. To do so, he starts from Kant, who differentiates between the phenomenon, the observable in reality, that which presents itself as symbolic and symbolic imaginary, and the noumenon. And the noumenon is that dimension to which we can never gain access by the way of the senses. And we can never gain access by way of the phenomenon of the perceptible beyond the symbolic imaginary that, con that constitutes our reality and can we perceive with the senses, there is the noumenon as that can never be accessed beyond the perceptible. With this, Lacan argues that Kant senses something of the real, something of the dimension of the object. So he says, the first dimension where this comes into play at the level of the status of the object is in the relation between the signifier and the body. In the relation between the signifier and the body, there is a void, a hole, through which the body cannot be placed in the sense of the perceptible either. If we place the body on, in the perceptible sense, we are in the imaginary field, the I prima A, which is the dimension of the representable body on the mirror. But there is an, another dimension of the body, the body not repens, representable in the mirror, the body that escapes the dimension of the representable, which is of the, the of which is of the bride, the drives. Then he says on page 88, if the specular, if this specular image we have facing us, which is our stator, our face, our two eyes, allows the dimension of our gaze to emerge, the value of the image starts to change above all if there is a moment with this case that appears in the mirror starts not to look at us anymore. There is an initium, an aura, a dawning sense of uncanniness which leaves the, or, the door open to anxiety. At that point in our specular image, the dimension of the gaze can come into play as a distressing element. This brings into play what Lacan calls the vacillation of the fantasy, the point where we are looking at ourselves in the mirror and suddenly the gaze appears as presence. Another quote, this passage from the specular image to the double that escapes me is the point at which something occurs called generality, was present within the entire phenomenal field can be shown through the articulation we have been given to the function of the A. So there he locates two dimensions of the object. The dimension of the locatable, traceable, interchangeable object, which Lacan will, con will call the common object in the imaginary, and the private, incommunicable object of the fantasy. In other words, there is our object of the fantasy and the object of perception. Then this incommunicable private object, which is the object of the fantasy, is the object A, and Lacan specifies its status. And, the, and, that Lacan, and that object, as long as it cannot be represented, it has no representation in the mirror. It has no signifier that names it. 
it is beyond the perceptible, beyond the nameable, and it is an object that cannot be, cannot be located, the noumena in, La, in Kant. This is why Lacan arrives at the last definition of anxiety. Anxiety is not without object. This strange formulation is not the same as saying, as saying that anxiety has an object or, or that anxiety is with object or that, or that anxiety is for the object. Rather, in the not without, the dimension of the unattainable, of the enigmatic is situated. It is not without object means that the anxiety refers to an object A, but that object cannot be trapped, nor signifier, not imagine it. As Lacan say, this relation of not being without having does not mean that one knows what, what object it is. It is not without object, it means that it refers to the object, but one does not know what object it is. Uh, finally, I, I, I want to, to present the phenomenology of the anxiety. Um, uh, at long in the seminar, Lacan, um, in these seven definitions of the anxiety, Lacan presents uh, different forms of presentation of the anxiety. We will refer with, without de developing it to the phenomenology of anxiety. We will only mention the modes that Lacan talks about anxiety throughout the seminar. And then you will develop them in the, in the seminar that you will um, work. The first, castration anxiety. This Freudian anxiety is linked to lack and desire that we mentioned. When there is castration anxiety, desire functions. It implies, it implies a lesser am amount of anxiety. It is the sensation that the subject always has that something is missing, that is never enough, that he must always do more. It must be differentiated from the superego, which subjectively resembles it, but it is different. Castration anxiety is the anxiety linked to, to lack. Uh, it is the lesser amount of, uh, of anxiety. Uh, second, the Freudian Erwartung or anxious expectation is the expectation is the anxiety in its state of expectation for what could happen is another form of the anxiety. Third, the anxiety that it is articulated, that it is articulated with inhibition and is, ex and is experienced as embarrassment. When inhibition is at, at, at his maximum difficulty, the actual sensation that Lagan distinguishes with the phrase earth swallow me now, in which the subject does not know where to hide. This anxiety is dangerous because it can be an antecedent of the passage to the act. Four, anxiety as a sign of the real. It is more than castration anxiety. This anxiety designates the imminence of the object. This anxiety has a wide range. It can go from a disturbing, enigmatic anxiety to an anxiety where all references are, lo are lost, where the subject loses his symbolic imaginary variables. All the definitions we have seen are situated at, at this level. Anxiety as the lack of lack, as a sign of the real, a certainty, as a sign of the presence of the object. This is uh, the, the, the main uh, definition of the anxiety. Uh, uh, five, anxiety that 
is articulated with inhibition, but in an experienced, but experienced at disturbance. When inhibition is at maximum, it is experienced as a movement of the of the anxious body, where the action that should be taken to resolve the anxiety is not undertaken, but unspecific body movements such as states of agitation, fainting, seizures, all states in which the power of the ego is lost, losing bodily control. Six, anxiety as vacillation of the fantasy. The scene that sustains the fantasy suddenly vacillates and the subject is no longer sustained by the fantasy. It falls. It is experienced as perplexity. Seven, anxiety as unhamily. It is an extreme of the vacillation of the fantasy, where that which was was familiar becomes unfamiliar and therefore becomes sinister. The subject no longer recognizes himself in the scene that previously housed him. Um, I don't know if you um, understand. There is a range. The, the minimum range is the castration anxiety. Then the the anxiety articulated with inhibition, like disturbance and, uh, and embarrassment. Uh, uh, then the, the erwartung, the, the anxiety with expectation. Then anxiety as sinister uh, is uh, climbing the, the, the amount of anxiety. Uh, therefore, the nightmare, the phenomenon of the unheimlich is presented in nightmarish dreams as a sign of another that enjoys the subject, an evil other, an evil other that is incarnated in a, in a demonic figure. Therefore, anxiety as the realization of the fantasy, not the vacillation, sino the realization. This nightmare scene is not presented in the dream, but in reality, in which the subject finds himself being enjoyed by the other, an evil other incarnated in some figure of his life, as in the example of the cruel captain in the Red Man. He is in an other that enjoys the subject, persecutes him, subjugates him, or torturates him. It's, it is the dimension that Lacan designates as the jouissance of the other. It enjoys the subject as an object with its subhits, comes, tortures him, like uh, the praying mantis. A uh, more amount of anxiety, anxiety, anxiety of, as panic. It is the extreme of the unheimlich. When no scene is recognized, the subject loses all reference and the sinister, sinister is located in the body it's itself. The body becomes unfamiliar. The subject does not recognize the sensations of the body and panic is produced as the articulation of the body with the sinister. Anxiety, anxiety as terror or, or dread. This is the other extreme of the Umheimlich in which the subject experiences not only the sinister in the body, but also in the field of the other. Reality is altered and becomes nightmarish. Anxiety as despersonalization. The extreme of panic implies the non-recognition of one's own person. The subject not only does not recognize his bodily sensation, but may not, not recognize himself. He completely loses the mirror image, his own recognition in the mirror. This phenomenon usually occurs in psychosis, but also in some states of neurosis. 
And the last one, anxiety as a phenomenon of the double. The extreme of depersonalization implies that the subject with, who no longer recognizes himself experiences himself as a stranger, as, as if he were someone else, as if someone else had taken control of himself. This phenomenon also occurs more commonly in psychosis and very exceptionally in neurosis. In conclusion, we went through the seven definitions of anxiety. First, we saw how the first two definitions refer to the, to the relation to the desire of the other, which are anxiety as a sign of the desire of the other and anxiety, anxiety as a fundamental affect. Second, we also saw how the next five definitions refer to the relation to the object of the fantasy and to the real. Anxiety as the lack of the lack, at that which does not deceive, a certainty as a sign of the presence of the object, and anxiety not without object. Finally, we have located the phenomenology of anxiety, going through the whole range of anxiety phenomena, from the least intense of the most unbearable, from castration anxiety as lack, to anxiety, to anxiety linked to inhibition, to sign anxiety, to the sinister, to the nightmare, to the real, realization of the fantasy, to panic, to terror, to despersonalization, and to the phenomenon of the devil. Well, okay. Finally. Wow. This was the amazing, end. Amazing, amazing work, Patricio. Thank you. Yeah. So, well, now we open the floor for the participants who wants to make a, a question. I would appreciate if you can write the question on the chat so it's easier for Patricia to understand. But also you can, you know, you can say it, speaking slowly, and then we'll try, we'll see if Patricia can respond in English or we can translate. Mm. Who wants to ask? Federica. Mm -hmm. uh, hi. So. Hi, Federica. Hi. <laughs> I'm just going to speak in English and we'll see. Um, so I was thinking in relation to anxiety number nine. Anxiety as the realization of the fantasy. And I was wondering if, uh, if it's related uh, or, or connected to what Lacan called uh, la cochina, the disgusting thing. Sort of knowing something about the experience of being the object of jouissance of the other. And, and that anxiety number nine in relation to the direction of the cure. I was kind of seeing if... if... Uh, la cochinada, uh, when, when Lacan talk about, uh, I, I don't remember it. So essentially just being, uh, knowing something about when you were the object of the Jewy sons of another, of the other. Ah, okay. Yes, um, uh, where the, the, the realization of the phantom, uh, of the fantasy is um, the realization of the nightmare. Uh, where uh, the the subject is um, enjoyed by the other, by the evil other, in the reality, not in the not in the dreams, um, and it is uh, a, a a bigger amount of of uh, anxiety because it is the 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 worst uh, one of the worst representation of of anxiety for example when the rat man uh, encounters with the with the cruel captain in this moment uh, it is insupportable for for him thank you it's okay laura 
Yes, in English, right? In okay. English. Okay. Okay. Um, first of all, I really want to thank you because you were very clear. This is the first time I listened to uh, the seminar 10 completely. So it was very clear for me. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, you, thank you. you meant thank you. Um, you mentioned in the end the the phenomenology of the anxiety. You said you were not going to extend much more about it, but I would like to know if you can tell us a little bit more about the difference between the castration anxiety and the superego. In a part, you said it resembles to superego, but it differs a little bit from it. Just a few words uh -huh. to make clear the difference between them. Thank you. Okay, there is an articulation between the anxiety um, and uh, castration anxiety and superego because uh, the function of the superego is um, all the time um, asking more to the subject. Uh, but Lacan presents the superego as a juicence. The, the superego uh, enjoys uh, um, asking more to the subject. In the version of the castration anxiety, the, the lack is uh, what causes uh, the desire. So uh, there is no uh, a Jewish sense of the superego in the in the castration anxiety. It is the movements of, of desire. When I'm when I am in a, a anxiety of castration, I am desiring. Uh, and I am moving uh, towards the desire. But uh, several times, uh, what, uh, what is beginning with desire becomes uh, a mission of the superego. And all the time in, in the neurosis, we have that experience, with, uh, we start uh, as a desire. I, I want to learn to play the guitar and it is a desire uh, to play the guitar and it becomes an exigence to, to the superego. And then I, uh, all the time I need to, to work all the day, uh, uh, playing the guitar and uh, and I I lose the the, the desire in, in that because it uh, becomes a, a mission of the superego and it becomes a jouissance of the superego for that is a little difference between the two of them hmm? thank you Jared. Hi, Patricio. Uh, thank you. Um, so I have two questions. Um, the first one I think will be simple, um, maybe a basic question. But so Lacan says that anxiety is that which does not deceive. And he also says that anxiety is a sign of the real. Can Is it a leap? to say that the real does not deceive either? Uh, can you translate? Because I, I didn't understand. I was so confident you would. Uh, so Ines, in, in, in could you, or oh, Andrea? Yeah. What, what I understood is that he's asking that because anxiety doesn't deceive, no? and anxiety as, as the real, no? So if we can say that the real doesn't deceive. Ah, yes, 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 we, we uh, sorry, I, I didn't understand. Uh, yes, the real uh, does not deceive, um, but uh, we can say always the real does not deceive, the real, um, 
comes back to the same place, says Lacan, and, and for that reason, it does not deceive, but the subjectivity uh, um, uh, feeling of that, uh, the, subject, the subjectivity effect of that is the anxiety. When uh, I, uh, when I encounter with the, with the real that, that comes back to the same place, uh, my effect for that is the anxiety. Mm -hmm. For that, the, when the subject experiments his sound repetition in the, in the symptom, uh, he feels anxiety with, uh, with the, the presence, the encounter of the same symptom that he repeats. And all, all, of, all of the times he feels uh, anxious with the symptom, okay? Because the real comes back to the same place in the symptom. Okay, okay, thank you. I think that makes sense. And the second question? So this one I have typed. Um, it's a, a little bit longer. Um, so, <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm, I've. It's in the chat or not? Ah. Sent it in the chat. Oh, okay. I am struck both by Daniel Roy's argument and Lacan's seminar 10, the way that space and how our bodies occupy is. Goodbye, it seems to come up over and over. It is there in presence, absence, his topology, the borrowment, not proximity of the object, the world, and the scene, and so on. Can you say? Uh, and, um, can you translate, uh, Ines? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. The way that the way that space and how our bodies occupy it seems to come up over and over. Uh, I don't understand that. Space and how our bodies occupy. Did, did you take that exactly as Royce says in the argument? No, I did not take it exactly from Roy's um, argument, but um, let me see how I can put this together. Um, in it, uh, he says that anxiety is the moment at which uh, we must produce our body in the real. Which ah. means that the real is a space. It's, it's a space mm -hmm. one can produce a body. And mm -hmm. comes up in the, the idea of space comes up in other places, like I, like I wrote as well. Um, the in presence and absence, you know, something is present or okay. absent because there is a space. Um, the body as a as a topology, as a surface, mm -hmm. lies space. Mm -hmm. Like I see it coming over and over. And uh, I okay, you could say it. Uh, see. Uh, now, I, now I understand because Lacan in this seminar. Um, makes a difference between the space in the geometry. The space in the geometry has a uh, way um, wide um, tall and volume. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is the, um, the geometry of the imaginary, is the space uh, that Lacan uh, says that we uh, perceive that space in a, in a spheric form. Um, the space uh, in the imaginary, we can perceive it with the five sense, um, five senses. Uh, but in that space, in, the, in that geometrical space, um, We can move, we can perceive, but we can, but we cannot 
sense the uh, the presence the presence of the real the presence of the real is uh, extracted is um, is veiled and only when when the anxiety comes we can perceive the body like a presence like the body not like uh like the geometrical space that lacan's uh lacan uh, puts in in kant with the um aesthetic um, aesthetics yeah. uh, transcendental aesthetics and the geometry of the imaginary we in the transcendental space and in the imaginary, we cannot uh, sense our body like a presence. We can sense the five senses, but we not we doesn't feel the presence of the body. The presence of the body only comes in the anxiety. Mm -hmm. In the other time, we sense the absence of the body. We we forget our body in the imaginary only we have the imagine of the image of the body the 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 image in the five senses not only the the image the the visual image uh, all we have all the 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 five senses uh, images of the body but we have not the presence of the body okay that was very clear. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for the question. I have one little question, uh, Patricia, about the taming of the anxiety. I thought it was, you know, never heard that that uh, expression. No, that the novice uh, analyst hasn't tamed the anal the anxiety, but the experience, yes. So I don't know if you can say. I don't know. Maybe know how to do with the anxiety or how. What do you? When you tame the well, uh, uh, Lacan says that the that the old analyst, mm -hmm. not the novice analyst, uh, has um, has tamed uh, his anxiety, has uh, learned to tame his anxiety uh, in the in the encounter with the with the patients with the. And with the patient's anxiety, uh, he 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 learns to tame his anxiety. Um, so the the experienced analyst, um, uh, because he learned to to tame his anxiety, uh, cannot. Uh, uh, he can't uh, experience the the enigma of the of the other's desire in in each patient the 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 novel analyst has the experience in in each encounter with each patient in uh, the the presence of the enigma of the of the other's desire uh, that idea is the same that Lacan uses uh, in the um, in the uh, presentation of the passant in the um, in the um, se llama? dispositivo this is dispositive of the of the past uh, because the 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 passant uh, is in the moment of the uh, fin finalization of the analysis, but he has not uh, find the the door of the of the way out uh, in the analysis. So he can uh, listen to the uh, passant um, to the. Pass, passer, uh, to the candidate uh, to the candidate uh, 
with a special uh, listening because uh, he uh, he has not uh, find uh, the the door of the of the way out. Uh, so uh, it's the same idea that the uh, young analyst uh, that he can uh, uh, listen to the to the patient uh, with uh, with um, uh, with 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 the same form uh, of his uh, 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 with with uh, no me no me salen las palabras with um, a ver eh, Andrea si podrías eh, traducirme with, eh, con su con su cercanía a la angustia el pa, el pasante eh, y el pasador tienen una cercanía parecida al del joven analista con su paciente eso sería that's a little bit hard for me to translate. Uh, so, but I think it's in the text um, you talked about this and uh, um, the young and uh, experienced um, analysts are very close um, as the candidate is uh, um, when he's doing the, the passage to the device of the pass. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the main idea. I, that's not an accurate uh, translation, but that's the main idea. Yes, yes, uh, but is, it is the, the idea. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, well, um, maybe we can leave if there is another question, but we're being, getting close to the end. So um, somebody else wants to... It was really very clear, Patricio. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. <clears throat> and and sorry for my pronunciation. No, you did amazing. <laughs> but you did perfect. We we understand <laughs> very clear. <laughs> in some in some moments where <laughs> it was a little difficult. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but but you did amazing. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Deborah, do you want to ask something or Carlos? <laughs> Everything fine. Yeah. So I just want to thank Patricio and say that the pronunciation was great. Yeah. So don't you <laughs> yeah. and you also okay, okay. and uh, it was really incredible the, the work and the precision that you had. Yeah, thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. So we should maybe. Bueno. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, we enjoy it very much. So now our, our job in, in Initiative Toronto is to read the, the, the seminar, uh, but with your guidance, you know, this, this is an amazing orientation. So thank you so much. Yeah, okay. I prepared that for the, uh, our Congress, the NLS Congress, so that's great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, I want to, to wish you a, a good work with the seminar. Um, I enjoy it uh, very much when I work the, the seminar these two years that, that I made a, a, a day seminar in the, in the hall. Mm -hmm. uh, working with all the seminar and uh, I, I enjoyed it uh, so much and I, I wish that you enjoy uh, also the, the work of, of this seminar because I think it's the, the seminar, the, the more clinical seminar of all the seminars in Lacan. Um, is the is uh, in which he presents uh, all the, the the forms of the clinic uh, of the neurosis of the psychosis of all the types of uh, neurosis and psychosis uh, 
all the all the manifestations, the clinic manifestations of the neurosis. I, I think uh, uh, we, you could uh, uh, work um, very very good in the in the seminar when you when you read it. Uh, you will enjoy it uh, for all the the clinical figures that uh, Lacan presents in the seminar. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for the invitation. Thank bye bye. You. Bye. Thank you.